Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing all right. How are you? Pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think we've actually. I mean, we've been complaining about the heat for a while <sighs> because it's South Alabama. <laughs> yeah. But in reality, this has been a pretty mild summer. <laughs> Uh, it didn't feel too mild yesterday. I had to get outside and do some actual yard work. And I don't mean like, normally when I say I'm going to do yard work, it means I'm going to like get on the lawnmower and ride around the yard a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like that's my yard work. I have a push mower, so that's, (laughs) mowing the lawn is a real yard work to me. Well, I did some real yard work yesterday. I finally had to get out there and do some weed eating. Because, and generally I don't weed eat. Generally I just use weed and grass killer on anywhere that I can't get the riding lawnmower into. Okay. (laughs) But we've had so much rain that like that kind of wore off. And so like I had like grass up to my waist almost in some areas. So (laughs) I was out there with the weed eater yesterday trying to tackle that. Yeah. It's hot out there. (laughs) Yeah. Well, what I was going to say actually is it's only been really in the last week that it has been consistently hitting high nineties. Yeah. No, you're right. But it usually starts that like before the end of June. No, you're not wrong. Like I say, um, but it's, it was real yesterday. (laughs) I'm just saying, Yeah. (laughs) at least, at least for me, it was, I, I generally don't, uh, mow the front and backyard at the same time. That's smart. Yeah, <laughs> because, yeah, I'm trying to avoid heat stroke, you know. <laughs> right. Um, but I did uh, this past this past week. Oh, do them both in one day? Yeah, back to back. Back to back. Oof. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's not smart. <laughs> and like every stitch of clothing that I had on was soaking wet. Like I could have, I I actually did wring out my shirt oh, before yeah. I came inside. I was gonna say. <laughs> and then I spent the rest of the day trying to catch up on hydration. I was like drinking glass after glass after glass of water. I still don't think I peed till three o'clock in the afternoon or something. Well, that was me yesterday. That's probably more information I mean, <laughs> than anybody out there wanted. But I drank two bottles before I went out there because I knew what I was getting into. And dude, I still was completely. Of course, I was wearing it like half an hour out there yeah. so i mean i know where it all went <laughs> well you walked up my uh the pathway from the driveway to my front door and you <laughs> see that i need to get out there and start pulling up some Ugh. weeds too i mean i don't use the i don't the use a weed whacker up, or whatever yeah. for that oh, yeah. Yeah. i just grab it and put some gloves on and yeah. pull it out i but, am not above doing that either but i had to let it get out of hand so yeah no yeah. ah I don't know. Like after after yesterday, I will probably just let it all sit there till the till it's not a hundred degrees outside anymore. Yeah, I look forward to a day where I can just pay somebody to do those kind of things that I really don't like doing. I mean, yeah. I don't mind mowing the lawn. I I yeah. get out there mow the lawn. I listen to some podcasts or listen to a book or something, and like that's no problem. Yeah. Um, but you know, down on my knees pulling weeds up and stuff like that. Oh, and <laughs> I hate trimming the hedges. Oh yeah, I'm the same way. I hate trimming the hedges. Yeah. It's not, it's not difficult work or anything. It just sucks. Yeah, you just don't want to do it. And <laughs> so, it would, honestly, so I always say I only do that a couple of times a year, mm-hmm. and it's in the winter time. Like I ain't trimming hedges this time of year. Yeah, I I got this. There's this little strip of kind of no man's land between me and my neighbor. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, it gets overgrown. It's technically my property, but there's there's nothing there. It's, it's just, just a, it's yeah, just like it's a little patch overgrown. of overgrown stuff. Yeah, because I, I bought this house as a um, foreclosure, and uh, like I've been trying to reclaim property since I moved in twelve years ago or <laughs> right. something like that. Yeah, because uh, when I first got in this house, it was in the Complete yard was in growth. terrible yeah. shape. Yeah. Um, so I, I've mostly got the backyard, although there's this big bush that's grown up next to the fence that I need to get rid of, that I got a little little mini <laughs> chainsaw to do, and I haven't, that's, just because I have Once haven't. again, sounds like a winter job. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, actually. I was like, if I can just hold out to the winter, it won't be as miserable. Exactly. But that no man's land over there gets grown over every spring and summer with um, stickers, yeah, like vines, sticker vines. And uh, I just like hang on till it's cold and then get out there with clippers and stuff <laughs> one day and heavy gloves and, and deal with it. You yeah. Know? Because the truth is that you don't want to go out there in the summer anyway, because you don't want to go out there in shorts. 
No. Because the problem is sticker bushes. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah. if you want to wear, if you're going to wear jeans when it's 96 degrees at 10 o'clock in the morning, that's really not the time. Yeah. So that's the home improvement portion of our show. <laughs> right. <laughs> or lack of in some respects. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just, I wanted to start uh, with just a little bit of a story that uh, last week, I guess it was last week, um, there was some software issues like all over the world. Oh yeah. <laughs> like, a whole bunch of systems went down everywhere, uh, impacting air travel and so forth. And, and everybody heard, well, it was, you know, some app with an error in it, that CrowdStrike had put out that, um, apparently wasn't tested at all, <laughs> all uh, right. or that wouldn't happen. Yeah. Uh, you know, you would think that, um, crash to desktop or, or crash to startup would be something that they would notice in QA before they put it out. Yeah, but you would, uh, do they not like quality test any of that stuff like that? Cause whenever that happened, I was like, that just boggles my mind that something could get out there that like just some bug in an app. Like, yeah, it, it was probably something that they thought was just like a little update. Yeah. But somebody struck out some line of code that was important or whatever. I, hmm. I don't know exactly what happened, but I did um, see that they there were people that were saying, well, if you go into the system and then you can just mark out this one line of code or you can or something. I, I, I don't remember exactly. And I'm not a coder. So, I, yeah. you know, but um, anyway, it was some, it was a simple fix. But it, the error obviously crashed everything. Yeah. So I'm, I'm guessing that what happened was that they just thought it was something easy and probably um, maybe within their development app, they uh, either turned something on, a line of code on that isn't usually, or they turned a line of code off that isn't usually and forgot to change, change it back before they pushed the change. Yeah. And But they just thought it was something simple and so they didn't need to check. Yeah. That's my guess. Yeah. But... I just wanted to, there are probably plenty of people out there that was like, CrowdStrike, I feel like I've heard that name before. I was one of them, by the way. Like I say, when I when they were saying, I was like, why do I know that name? And I, I never got an answer till you the other day, so go for it. <laughs> yeah. So um, you may remember in 2016, uh, the DNC servers were quote unquote hacked. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, there was an investigation done and they determined that Russia hacked the DNC servers. Yeah. Well, it was CrowdStrike that the DNC servers were given to to investigate the hack. Yeah. All right. So it was CrowdStrike that essentially launched the Russia stuff. Now, you can't play with the wires, Kat. You can sit in my lap, but you can't play with the wires. <laughs> um, now I got distracted. Okay. Anyway, so they essentially started the, the Russiagate hoax, um, mm-hmm. and a lot of the antagonism toward Russia by saying that Russia was responsible for the DNC hacks that, that damaged the Clinton campaign and so on. Yeah. Now, um, we found out like a year later, roughly that in their closed session of Congress where, um, where CrowdStrike was being interrogated about their evidence for the hacks. And of course the FBI could have taken the servers and done their own investigation, but they just let CrowdStrike do it. Trust the third party, Ukrainian owned, as I recall. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know those Ukrainians; they're all on the up and up. Yeah, like, cyber there's, no, there's no no corruption there. So yeah, cybersecurity company. Um, they uh, eventually they released the um, the documentation for the the congressional session where they were where they were interviewing the CrowdStrike people where the CrowdStrike people admitted that they had no evidence of intrusion. Not just no evidence that Russia hacked it, but yeah. no evidence that there was a hack at all. Yeah. Oh, wow. They just asserted that Russia was responsible with nothing. Yeah. Just throwing and that's it out what there. They, and that's what they told us all over the United States and, and made us believe that Russia was responsible. Yeah. So, well, a lot of us anyway. Not some of us. <laughs> yeah. And so then it leaves you to wonder now yeah. how it is that a company that wasn't particularly well-known at that time could have failed something so monumentally yeah. 
by giving absolutely false and completely baseless information out that created um, a, a serious international friction yeah. between the two biggest nuclear powers in the world. How it is that they could have, after that, become so valuable to so many companies that they could practically crash the world through one little update. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, makes you... <laughs> things that make you go, hmm. So, I mean, <laughs> in a lot of ways, it, it might not be so sinister. Uh, they were doing work for the government, and government has a real strong history of failing upwards. Yeah. Um, so you screw up badly enough, you, you just keep getting promoted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so that may be the case here, or it may be that they've gotten a whole lot more contracts since then because they said exactly what they were asked to. Yeah. Uh, and it makes you wonder if this, this whole little incident that happened this last time isn't the same thing. It was like, hey, we need a good distraction here. Oh, yeah. And, no, I think they just screwed up this time. But yeah. I think the reason that they have all that, uh, why they're such an in a, integral part of so many systems is probably a result of them doing as they were asked and getting rewarded with contracts afterwards. Yeah. Or, or once again, it could have been a soft run to see like how integrated are we here? If we screw something up, what exactly happens? Yeah. If we need to prevent all air travel, how easy is it? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Turns out not that difficult. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying. I, um, um, it boggles my mind that, that we live in an age where we have so much technology and we're, we're so dependent on it. And it's not just talking about this, but just with everything. Like I know in my business, like I, I've been doing it long enough that I remember not having all the little technology perks. Mm -hmm. and, and those things are nice, but it's, it's so crazy. But when you lose them, it's like the business shuts down. And it's like, I remember a time where we didn't even have this. Yeah. And now if we don't have it, we have to shut down? Yeah. Are you kidding me? Like, it just... Wait a minute. Our, our cell service went down, so we can't run credit cards. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> like, it's it just blows my or, mind. Our cell service went down, or our internet service went down, so therefore our... Um, we, Points of sale can't communicate with anything, and so we can't process anything at all. Or, or we yeah. can't accept deliveries. Yeah. Like, oh I mean, my goodness, really? Well, yeah, and it's like crazy because like we didn't even have the stuff to, for a long time, mm -hmm. and we took deliveries just fine back then. But yeah. now all of a sudden the internet's out, and I can't. Ex what what kind of world are we living in? Yeah, you um, know what's f funny about this is that so I do finance for my company, and uh, our of course our technology has. Uh, has moved forward quite a bit. I've been working for him almost 20 years. Yeah. Um, You're in the same boat I'm in. So you've been in the same industry for a long time. Yeah. yeah. But I actually still, I still like paper. Yeah, yeah. And so I keep paper records of almost everything. Yeah. Uh, like all the transactions and so forth. So that way, if our accounting software just crashes completely or whatever, you have would, records. Yeah, it would be terrible, but I could actually reproduce <laughs> what you have. <laughs> almost everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I you can't even cannot talk about that. <laughs> yeah, I can't but, even imagine having to do that, right? No, no. I mean, and we've moved that onto the, you know, into cloud services too. So they're supposed to be backing that stuff up. Yeah. But uh, I remember when we started doing our own backups, like um, off site backups. Yeah. And even today, we still, like, we, we rotate out hard drives. So yeah. every day a new hard drive goes in, an old hard drive goes out and we, we rotate them essentially like three or four. Yeah. Um, so that if that worst case scenario, yeah. we can produce everything that reproduce everything that happened day before yesterday. Yeah. And like a 24 hour period or something. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's incredible to, to think about how, how reliant everybody is on everything. and But the well, most frustrating us, thing is how little backups to these things that there are. You would think that there would be a contingency. Like, yeah. okay, if this service goes down, then our system automatically switches over to a, a essentially a parallel service, a service yeah. that does the same thing. But it, it doesn't seem to be how it works. It's all just integrated. But it makes us so vulnerable. Like, that's what kills me is the vulnerability um, that... that like all of these companies are exposed to the government, like everybody. It's just, it's wild. 
I'm sorry, this cat's driving me crazy. Yeah, I see that. <laughs> <laughs> Stay, uh, stay there. Sit in that chair. Yeah. You good can, luck. Uh, yeah. And now she's intent. I, I yeah, made you, the mistake you, of petting her. You when have she came started over something. Already. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Now <laughs> she's got all this energy. She doesn't know what to do with. Yeah. Oh well. Um. <clears throat> so anyway, that's that's where you know CrowdStrike from. Yeah. yeah that's interesting because when I heard the name last week, I was like, Why do I know that name? Like it's so familiar, but mm-hmm. couldn't place it. Yeah, they're the ones that lied about. Um, the DNC server quote unquote hack that they had no evidence that there was even a hack and they sure had no evidence that it was, <laughs> it Russia. was Russia. Yeah. <laughs> Just assume it's Russia. Um, so you wanted to talk about the Olympics. I haven't been tracking this. Stuff, yeah. So. I mean, I've only been tracking it a little bit, but I, it, it just got me thinking about something more broad. So, I mean, I'm sure I actually haven't watched the whole thing. I've, I've seen little snippets of the opening ceremony. Mm-hmm. Um, if, for people who haven't watched it, they basically had a bunch of trans people do some kind of performance. And I guess at the end of it or somewhere during it, they did, what's the, the Last Supper? Yeah, I, I some people are saying that it was a parody of The Last Supper. And their materials that they put out beforehand describing what the ceremony and so forth, yeah. um, they were talking about it as a parody of the Bacchanalia. Yeah. Which would at least be a Greek connection. Yeah. Whereas the the Last Supper, at least the painting that everybody's referring to, is is in Italy. Yeah. Um, I, no connection to France. At least the Olympics, is, at least traditionally, has a connection to Greece. So. Yeah. I, I don't think it's unreasonable to think that that's what they were doing. Yeah, especially and, since they put that out in advance, and they seem to put out a sincere apology afterwards. Yeah, well, the, I think the sincere apology is because of the backlash that they well, sure. received. But I don't think um, they expected a backlash. Yeah, and they maybe they didn't. Yeah. Uh, to me, that's not like, so that's kind of what's going on. But the thing that's just kind of been astonishing to me is particularly as far as us libertarians are concerned. I mean, we're basically split into two camps on this like we are on everything else is there's the one side that is absolutely just bending over backwards to excuse and and make excuses for this whole thing and then there's the other side that's like oh no this was horrible like why we shouldn't have to be do this and blah 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 and it's just it just, the the two camps like we basically have two camps of libertarians now mm-hmm. it's the chase libertarians and it's the mises libertarians and it's, I think it's time for a divorce. Like, I just, I, I feel like us as a party, it's something's got to change here. Like, we, mm-hmm. we're never going to have a unified message as long as there's this division between the two. And the two camps are so ingrained. Like, for me, I don't care anything about it. I didn't watch it. I mean, I don't really, I don't have a big opinion on it one way or the other, to be truthful with you. But both of our camps have a big opinion on it. Yeah. And that that's what bothers me is and because this is nothing but a distraction regardless of how you feel about it. So what is the Mises camp saying about this? I, I mean they're just uh, they don't th- that it's not that it's not something that they would I mean I don't want to say they're going as far as like boycott the Olympics or anything, mm-hmm. but I mean they're just they're opposed to it. They don't opposed like it. Opposed to what exactly? The the just the whole that type of ceremony, I guess, like that type of thing. I mean that, I don't that really it's know. offending Christians. Yeah, that, well it's just offensive in general, I think. Um not even so much specifically the Christians, just the whole idea of like I say, I mean Well, I think a lot of those people are the same people that not too long ago would have been saying that um you have a right to be offended, but everybody else has the right to offend also. Yeah. So yeah. Like what, a, what's the problem here? I like yeah. if I don't know what's going on exactly here. Cause I don't, I don't follow our internal, our internal politics. I don't follow um, it that close, but it's just, but, it it's just irritating to me that there's that everybody has kind of bought into this distraction because that's all it is. Like it's, well, it, it irritates me to think that the, that, the group that I generally align with would be out there calling um, that they're being the playing victim cards about, you know, Christians being offended or whatever. That just yeah. seems silly to me. Yeah. Um, like if you're offended, that's fine. Like you have every right to be offended or whatever, but 
Yeah. France has no responsibility to you. The <laughs> yeah. Olympic Committee has no responsibility to you. Yeah. Like you want to be offended, go right ahead, but you can't say that this kind of thing can't be done or that I mean I don't know. I it don't just know seems that, I don't, ridiculous to me. I don't like, know that there's voices out there necessarily saying that. Mm-hmm. Um but just I mean that it, it's not something that I don't know that I would say that they they appreciate. I I okay. I'd put it that way. Yeah. Um which like I say, I mean for whatever it is, but the but the other side, the chase side of this, like they are just absolutely defending this to the to the hills, like just like sure because they're usually they usually get to play victim. Yeah. So we've just reversed roles of who gets to play victim in this, <laughs> right? That's yeah. what it sounds like to me, and so yeah. the whole thing seems absurd. Um, Which is the reason, like, so we were talking the other night. Like, I think it's time for us to just leave the party. Like, just as, as far as I, we need a split. Like, one of these two groups has got to leave the party. And I don't mind it being my group. I just I, I just think that we could, both sides could do more independently than they can together. Because we're, we're always going to end up in this position where we're at right now, where we're just arguing over st- stuff that's just not important. Well... I think that the answer there is to quit arguing about the stuff that's just not important. Because if we're 3% at best anyway, then you split in half. You both have 1.5% of the population. Like, what good are any of you going to do then? And the truth is that these little things, these are little things. You just said yourself. It's just not important. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, obviously, I would... I would follow they, the Mises group out if there was such a split. But the truth is that the, the these two wings of the party share such a huge amount of things in common that they share in common with no other political group in the United States. It seems ridiculous to try and divide it. To divide it. I, I understand that argument, but I don't think that I don't think these two groups working together can grow. Because the the people that the Mises... Well, I think that they could if they worked together. Maybe. You may, you may, you're <laughs> I mean, not that, wrong. That, that's really the problem, is that both sides are being intransigent. But they're, but they're not going to. Well, um, I mean, we said, you know, eight years ago, there were the Trumpers and the Never Trumpers, and everybody was sure that that was going to split the Republican Party and they would never be the same again. Yeah. And, I mean, that's... They're they're not the same. Well, they're not they the same, to. but they're still presenting a fairly unified message. Yeah, they they are they are doing that, but they're definitely there's definitely a lot of people in the Republican Party that have found themselves homeless. I think. Sure. Um, I mean, I'll say that I don't know that they've well, necessarily I mean, jumped to Democrats. Like, if if but, either if either group within the Libertarian Party decided that they weren't going to be a part of it anymore, they would find themselves homeless. Yeah. I mean, this is the best home you've got, probably, if you're in the party. Yeah. I, I yeah. mean, I, you can not, try and form something else, I but just, then you're starting from scratch again. Yeah. I and, just don't see how, because the, the people that the Mises Caucus would want to bring into the party are just completely opposite from the people that the Chase side would want to bring into the party. I don't think that that's As far as growth. True. I just I don't I don't understand how, how you are they make, opposite because the the chase side is pandering to the left. I mean it's it's real simple. Like the mm-hmm. the chase side would be pandering to the left, and the Mises people would be trying to 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 bring in people from the right. And the the truth is is they both have potential. Like because the truth is is that if you're trying to chase the left, the left you're not going to ever catch that. Probably not. But. But can, there are plenty of conservatives that are pretty close to being libertarian. They're not like they're missing some things, but they're not missing a lot. Yeah. Well, there's right now, and I, I mean, yeah. just right now yeah, at this point in history. Yeah. Um, there's a lot more fertile ground on the right to sow the seeds of what we're selling. Yeah. Uh, than there is on the left. That yeah. has not historically been true. Well, no, it hasn't because I started as a. Well, I've always really been a libertarian, but as far as where I leaned beyond libertarian, mm-hmm. for the longest time it was the left. Yeah, I mean under George W. Bush, yeah. like <laughs> I was, I was not leaning. Like I had no love for Republicans at all. Mm-hmm. But that has completely flipped now. Yeah, um, to the other direction. I was absolutely politically homeless before I found the Libertarian Party. I, yeah. I was like, well. I, 
I know I'm not this and I'm pretty sure I'm not that. So <laughs> where do I, what do yeah. I do from here? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, I don't um, know. I don't know that a, a divorce of the two sides is, is, is the right answer, but it should be something that's at least considered. Yeah. Because the party's going through it anyway with the stuff that's going on in Colorado and these other places where they're, you know, they're not the, because the Mesa side is so hardcore, at least in some areas that they're just not going to support chase. Mm -hmm. Um, like, I mean, the party's fracturing anyway. I mean, this may come about naturally. Like, I, this is something that I think I, okay. So, part of what I think is valuable about what we do here is that I am absolutely nonpartisan and that includes the libertarian party. I'm a member of the libertarian party, but I don't fall in line. If I don't agree with what's going on, I'll, I'll say it. If I don't support the candidate, I'll say it. If I do support the candidate, I'll say it too. I mean, I, I go where I think, um, my, political ideology or philosophy has the best chance of being pushed forward. Yeah. Um, which this year I think right now is RFKJ. Yeah. Uh, that probably won't go anywhere either, but that's where I see the best opportunity to see some of the things that I would like to see done at the national level. Yeah. If not done, at least get some attention. Yeah. Which is really the game right now. Like, and that's what us as libertarians have to remember is like, like that is the game right now. We, we ain't winning office yet. We've got to, we've got to bring more people in. But at the end of this election, what do I do? Yeah. I fall back into the libertarian party. I start pushing our agenda there to see what we can do two years, four years from now. Yeah. And if we put up a candidate that I support in four years, then I'll be all about it. Yeah. Um, and if we put up a candidate that I don't support in four years, then I'll either find somebody else or I'll make it very clear why I'm not voting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know. I just don't see, I don't see the value of splitting. Um, I don't understand the animosity. Well, I do to some degree. I think that a big part of the animosity is actually how the Mises caucus, the rhetoric from the Mises caucus when, they entered the party yeah. that we're taking over. They, they made the way they presented what they wanted to do was like, okay, we're going to make this ours and we don't care what you want. The people that have been there before. Yeah. And that obviously alienated a bunch of people yeah. that would probably otherwise m- support a lot of what the Mises caucus is trying to do. Yeah. Um, I mean, in fact, I would say that it's clear because the, the, Mises Caucus was a minority at this last convention, yeah. but Angela McArdle got reelected on the first ballot. Yeah, <laughs> which is kind of astonishing. <laughs> yeah. So obviously there are people that'll, that weren't Mises and aren't Mises and will support what the Mises Caucus is trying to do if they look like they're yeah. making progress in some significant way. Yeah. And as much as people complained about you know, what Angela was doing is... Um, as the the party chair, obviously the, enough. She people, had a majority. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wanted her to keep doing it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, um, I I don't think that there's as much of a split. I I do think that there are certainly some groups on both sides that are hardcore and will never come to any kind of agreement. But I think that that most libertarians, if, if they're honest and objective at least. And I hope that most libertarians are just anyway. Yeah. Um, there's no reason to divide these two factions within the libertarian party. Yeah. Um, I think that the, the two factions can make each other better in a lot of ways. Um, and it, you try and do the same thing that you do as a libertarian, trying to bring, um, right wing or left wing people, into libertarianism and or at least into a better understanding. You just, you focus on where you have common ground. Yeah. Yeah. No, say, I agree with that. Oh, you know, you agree that the U S shouldn't be involved in foreign wars. Hey, me too. <laughs> right. <laughs> Look at all these terrible things that have happened because of the U S being involved in foreign wars. And you know, as long as we're on that, um, you know, those wars wouldn't even be able to be enabled if it wasn't for the feds monetary policy. So, Maybe yeah. I can convince you that uh, maybe the government shouldn't control the money <laughs> while <laughs> right. we're at it. You, you know, you just yeah. 
you find yeah. where you have common dra- common ground and you try and draw lines between those things and other things that maybe you don't to let them see another perspective. And I don't see why a bunch of libertarians that have disagreements on really kind of fringe issues. Yeah. Well, fringe political issues should have, have any more trouble doing that. Yeah. Except that, you know, we all think that we're right about everything. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, well, and then there's that, right? (laughs) I mean, but I, I like to try and understand why people think the way that they think. Yeah. No, I'm the same way. That's why I was out there calling for somebody on the left wing. Like, man, if I could find another, like, really intelligent socialist that has thought about why they believe what they believe and can, can hold a, yeah, hold a debate can discuss this without getting angry. (laughs) Um, man, I would, I would be happy to meet that person again. We used to have this girl that I worked with years and years ago. She was the resident, like wildly left winger. Yeah. And, uh, Man, I talk to her a ton. I yeah. miss her a bunch. Yeah. Um, there's somebody else at the office that's a left wing, but she's more like, you know, I watch CNN and this is where my opinions come <laughs> she, from. She's pretty good at repeating the talking points. <clears throat> yeah. Because that's what I find so often on both sides, mm-hmm. to be fair. Yeah. But the left a little more than the right. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've yeah. been talking about that a bunch recently that the, you know, your left winger is like, this is what CNN told me and your right wingers are, li- this is what Fox News told me. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that, uh, I, yeah, I just don't see, uh, you were going to interrupt me when I said fringe issues. So what oh, do you don't have know. to say about that? It's just, I, I agree about fringe issues, but I don't know that the trans issue is a fringe issue. Well, it's an issue that, it's an issue like abortion that our stance should essentially be that the government shouldn't be a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Now I know that that's, that's another divisive that's, issue within that's the Libertarian a hard Party. Pill to swallow. But yeah. it, it's, I mean, the truth is that the medical professionals and the families and the children involved should be in the place to make the decisions about this stuff, not a bunch of politicians. Yeah. I mean, I don't disagree about that, but I kind of do, though. <laughs> like, I mean, well, I, I know, know you do, but yeah. the, you know, I, I'm. I'm personally opposed to abortion, yeah. but I don't think that there should be laws about it. Yeah. I, I'm a little different than you in that respect. I mean, I, I do, I don't know that they should be as starkly drawn as they are in mm-hmm. a lot, in most areas probably, or a lot of areas in the South at least. Mm-hmm. But like, I do think that we should have some stuff regulating that. <laughs> well, I mean, okay. So I think it's a life. I think that, it that, you know, it's, it's taking of a life, but at the same time, our whole philosophy is built around not the, imp, not using force to impose our beliefs on others. Well, and that's that's what I was going to say is it, it is tough, though, because I don't want the government defining when that is. Oh, well, yeah. I certainly don't want the government <laughs> to define what life is. It's yeah. Like, dangerous. so, I mean, it it is a it is a tough thing. Mm-hmm. It, for even if, as a libertarian, like, I mean, it's it's. Yeah. I mean, that's where you have to you have to fall back on the philosophy and say, look, it's not my place or anybody else's to impose my beliefs on others by force. Yeah. Yeah. Like this isn't my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I get to make it's, decisions about my life. I don't get to make decisions about other people's lives. Yeah. No, I, even if I disagree with them, yeah, I can reason with them. I can argue with them, Yeah. but I can't tie their hands. Yeah. No. Oh. I'm with you on that, and, and at least at least the idea of that, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> the spirit of that. Uh, all right. Oh well, as long as we're on the trans issue, there was some other. Oh, Olympics so news. so yeah, that so that just came in today, and I haven't really got to look into this at all, other than just a few things I've seen here and there on the internet. But apparently, they had a. What what did it what was it? Intersexual Yeah, intersex person. Intersex person was fighting a a woman today mm-hmm. at the Olympics and she lasted the, the lady lasted forty six seconds in the ring with this man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it it's yeah, pretty pretty insane. 
Yeah. The, the okay. So intersex is an actual biological phenomena. Okay. Anomaly. Yeah. I should say. Um, so this is what we used to call a hermaf- hermaphrodite. Okay. So this is something that just happens sometimes where no. biology screws up and somebody comes out with both male and female sex organs. So they like from birth. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. This isn't something if, yeah. if it's actually intersex, yeah. this isn't that's something one that they, of the things that's been medically seen. imposed or yeah. created. This is actually so biological. In a situation like that, how would, how would you decide where this person falls as far as like sporting events? And oh, hell like if that? I know. I mean, like, I, I would say that if you have a Y chromosome, you qualify as male. Yeah. <laughs> that's how I, Although because the pictures I've seen, like, this looks like a dude. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm just saying, like, I don't know. But, like, all I've seen is the picture of the dude and the picture of the chick that got beat up. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, I, I would I, I would define it at the chromosomal level. And I would just say, like, if you, if you have a Y chromosome, you're male. Yeah. Period. I mean, that's just what it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? like, yeah. yeah. Female is XX only. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So yeah. I, that's how, that's what I would, that's how I would handle it. But I, yeah. I'm not on any of these boards and I'm not yeah. a medical doctor. Well, I think that they'll be looking into this one a little further. I do further. know quite a lot about biology though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that this will be dove into pretty hard as far as the, what's the governing body for the Olympics? The IA? I- IOC. IOC. Yeah. Mm. Um, it's the there, International Olympic Committee. Well, this just happened today. And like I said, I hadn't really got a whole lot on it yet, but, um, like there's already calls for like something to be done here. Yeah. It's so. amazing to me that they would allow um allow somebody in that situation to compete with women particularly in a contact sport like yeah. that. That's just well, I think your reaction when I was telling you about it was the was the best. Was like, well, did he kill her? <laughs> like, yeah. Well, that, yeah, that was my first question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Because that, I mean, in the way she speaks, at least in the little bit, the few posts that I've seen, where because they interviewed her afterwards, and she was mm-hmm. like, "I've never been hit that hard in my life." Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. So, well, and you got to remember, in the Olympics and boxing, they have more padding than pro- professional boxing in the U.S. They have oh, yeah. the um, they have the headgear and the heavy gloves, um, and I think the women have chest Protecting. protected protection yeah. also. Um, although I don't know that I've actually seen women's boxing in the Olympics, but I, at any rate, um, I think that they, I I feel like I've seen a picture and they had the chest protection also. Yeah. I could be wrong about that though. Yeah. But, uh, I, yeah, I'm just, I'm kind of blown away. I, I, I'm just amazed. Like, how is it to be in the crowd of that? Like, I thought I was coming to a boxing event and essentially I came ringside to domestic violence <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, i'm just <laughs> like, uh, oh. unreal yeah. well um I, there's a lot going so on around I was gonna israel say, you had some actual important news that yeah. you wanted to get to today <laughs> there's a lot going on you know what's funny about this is that i've been meaning to talk about um the prospects of war in lebanon between israel and lebanon for like a month oh yeah and just haven't <laughs> had the time you know, Things keep happening. Well, the, dude, <laughs> dude, this past month, July, as far as like history goes, mm-hmm. like that'll be like a whole chapter in history books. <laughs> July 2024, United States history. Yeah, like mm-hmm. that'll be a whole, there's so much went on last month. It was mm-hmm. really kind of incredible. And I, I don't think it's going to slow down, by the way, like for people listening out there, like the, the next th- few months till we get through this election is going to be like that. So buckle up. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, so Benjamin Netanyahu addressed a joint session of Congress. Yeah. Um, something like 80 people didn't attend. I say okay. good for them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, he spoke yeah. for less than an hour, got uh, nearly a standing ovation a minute. Yeah. So so did just the whole time they were just like... I mean, their leader came. I mean, he's, it was it was very kind well, of him to come visit us. <laughs> there's a, there's a lot of um, reason to think that he is the um, foreign policy leader. <laughs> I, I, like, yeah. States. I mean, in all seriousness, like, I mean, he seems to call the shots, and it for 
for both administrations, like for, mm-hmm. for Trump and for Biden, at least the last two, like he seems to be the shot caller. Yeah, I heard somebody else say that he, you know, the, the leader of the conservative movement in the United States gave an address to Congress. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. not far off. Um, at least there's some dissent on the left. There was only one yeah. Republican that didn't show up to a speech. Guess who? Oh, uh, was it Massey? Yes, it was Massey. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the other 70 or 80 were all Democrats, yeah. um, including, I will say, uh, Kamala Harris. Really? Um, well, yeah, but... I'm trying to think like... Was she I, just busy? I mean, she's got a lot going on. It's possible. Did, so she um, met with him afterwards, yeah, though, right? Yeah, Netanyahu is not happy about her comments about it either, afterwards, oh, after really? that meeting either. So Interesting. You know, we'll we'll see. I can't remember her making any public statements about her position on this. She's... T- I've only heard a little bit. I want to say that she's been pretty... Pretty big on the Palestinian side, though, okay. as far as the plight of the Palestinians. Now, don't quote me because I'm I'm trying to remember where I heard that or where I'd seen that or or and I don't, and I don't remember. So, yeah. Um, well, um, a, a couple of things to note, uh, just to start off, is that Netanyahu flew direct to the United States. Oh yeah. Um, and he flew direct to the United States because the International Criminal Court has named him as a war criminal. And so he had to go from Israel to the U.S. to avoid the possibility of being arrested. Of being detained. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, crimes against humanity, I think, actually, is what yeah. the, what they said. But yeah. By the way, Putin has that same problem, just so. Yeah. <laughs> Every, he does. Just so it's out there. <laughs> um, I, yeah. Interesting that. I the, would draw some dividing lines between those two things, but. We're not going to bother with that today. Okay. Um, another thing is that in Netanyahu's speech, I'm, uh, I don't know that he said the word peace one time. Huh. Yeah. I don't think so. I mean, I can't imagine he would. Like, I mean, I mean, he, because he's not interested. In he's peace. not interested in peace. There's, that's for sure. Uh, and I, I want that to be really clear to Americans who are hearing, I, I think, a propagandized version about what's going on. Yeah. Um, I, I hope that I can present some information here. I should have should have written down um, the boy's name. Oh, well. Anyway, it, I'll mention that again later. Uh, I may have a chance to look it up before we're done. But one of the things that is, of course, one of the, the complaints about the um, people that are protesting on the side of the Palestinians uh, is the chant from the river to the sea. And, of course, it's from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Yep. Um, but I just heard a, uh, a a translation, because he was speaking Hebrew, maybe, or I guess Hebrew, um, that Netanyahu gave January, at middle of January, January 18th, uh, where he said, um, Israel will in the future control all of the area from the river to the sea. And it is part of the Likud party's uh, formation documents, whatever they call them, um, that uh, that Israel will be the only security force between the river and the sea, and that um, they will exclude anyone who's not Jewish. Hmm. So the goal of his party is, in fact, what they keep claiming that Hamas's goal is, except on the other side. Yeah. Now Hamas has changed their charter. Yeah. Um, so it no longer includes the elimination of um, the Jewish the, the Jews. Yeah. Uh, but the Likud party's um, charter, I guess, yeah. we'll use the same word, still includes that all that space will be occupied only by Jews. Wow. Yeah. So pick your side, I guess. But <laughs> yeah, like, there aren't any good. I was going to say, there's no good guys here. So no. Um, and then the uh, the International Court of Justice uh, just made a decision about the Israeli settlements in the West Bank, um, saying that they are illegal by international law. Yes, obviously. Yeah. Um, you're not supposed to settle in occupied territory. That's has been a part. You're not supposed to use war to expand your territory. That's part of the deal. Yeah. Um, but the since the 
the Israeli state took over these territories in 1967, they've been slowly moving out the people that live there and settling their own people in them. Um, yeah. That's actually also true of Gaza, but they had so much trouble there that they, the the withdrawal from Gaza actually happened where they said the um, the IDF said that we can no longer protect the settlers in Gaza, so everybody <laughs> moved out. Yeah. Um, because you force these people into like that's all that's left. Yeah, I mean, I mean they're already refugees. The yeah. Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank are already refugees. Yeah, and there's a lot of. I, I mean, I keep hearing people say that other countries won't take the Palestinians. Um, mostly, that's because other countries have already taken Palestinians, and yeah. they see this as, as they can't. They, they can't would take lose them the territory. All. They can never regain the territory that they've lost. Egypt, yeah. Syria, um, and uh, Jordan all have territory that's officially theirs that is occupied by Israel. Yeah. And as long as the Palestinians are still living in those, and actually the Syrian territory, it's occupied by the Druze. I mean, occupied. It's the residents are Druze people. Okay. We'll get to that later because that's actually important too. But um, the Palestinians in the West Bank, Palestinians in Gaza, if, if those two territories end up devoid of Palestinians then there's no way that Egypt or Jordan can ever reclaim their territory. Yeah, those areas are right? just going to be lost. Those areas will be forfeited, yeah. Um, and both of those places and Syria and Lebanon already have Palestinian refugees there, so yeah. uh, living there. Anyway, um, and, and just to remind people, the so now we have this decision on the settlements being illegal, um, it was also the ICJ that uh, that decided earlier that there was plausible evidence for the charge of genocide by the Israeli state. Yeah. Um, so now with this new decision about the settlements, they have urged the UN to treat Israel as an outlaw state, as yeah. a pariah state. Yeah. Which won't happen because the United States is the enforcement arm of the UN. Exactly. Um, and we're one of the only countries in the world that... Netanyahu can fly over to give an address to the ruling body um, <laughs> and get a whole bunch of standing ovations and no arrest. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, um, now let me just let's just play the first clip that I have of Netanyahu. Okay, um, and we'll take it from there. All right. The prosecutor of the International Criminal Court has shamefully accused Israel of deliberately starving the people of Gaza. This is utter, complete nonsense. It's a complete fabrication. <laughs> Israel has enabled more than 40,000 aid trucks to enter Gaza. That's half a million tons of food. And that's more than 3,000 calories for every man, woman, and child in Gaza. If there are Palestinians in Gaza, who aren't getting enough food, it's not because Israel is blocking it, it's because Hamas is stealing it. Okay, so... Well, it sounds like everything's all good over there. I guess so. I, uh, <laughs> I mean, that's... Uh, that's, what, that's what he says. Yeah. Um, of course, uh, Netanyahu's a liar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, he asserts that, uh, that Israel has facilitated food into Gaza. Um, this 3,000 calories... Uh, Per person, like over what time frame? Like since a year ago when this thing began? <laughs> yeah. I, there's yeah, that to, to even measure it that way just seems suspect to me, and maybe that's just weird. To, I'm, it just seems strange. Well, he's trying to insinuate that they're getting three thousand calories per person per day. Yeah, yeah. But since he doesn't give a time frame, it's just yeah. it's just to make you think that. Yeah. Um, so they may have actually permitted that much food to go into Gaza, but over what time frame? That's the important part. Yeah. And um, this claim that everyone else, everyone who's been trying to provide aid to Gaza has said Israel's been obstructing it, yeah. including the United States. Yeah. You remember the U.S. I've, built that ill-fated dock to try and get around to bypass the Israeli obstructionism. Yeah. It. Failed <laughs> All right. because the dock failed. But yeah. the reason that the U.S. was building that dock is so that they wouldn't have to go through the Israeli authorities to get and aid into Gaza. they could just Gaza. get stuff in there. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, starvation is rampant uh, throughout Gaza. They have a hepatitis outbreak, um, a polio epidemic. Uh, all the hospitals and universities have been destroyed by the Israeli by Israeli bombs, American bombs, actually, I should say. Yeah. Um, dropped by the Israelis. Now, there are still hospitals that are kind of functioning. Something yeah. like 10 of the 30-some hospitals in Gaza are kind of functioning. Yeah. That's, that's God, man. Um, they're, they're bombing schools that have been, that are being used as shelters by the, the people of Gaza. They've, there were only 2.3 million people in there to start. Yeah. Um, and there's something like 1.9 million refugees within Gaza right now. Yeah. So like more or less the whole population. And you know, one of the things that's that they, left surviving <laughs> and I, I, I hesitate to recommend people look this up because it's such a terrible image. But um, but if you have any doubts about how badly things are going for people in Gaza, just look up this this one kid, Fadi Alzant, or however you spell it, or uh, say it, I don't know. F-A-D-I, and the last name is A-L hyphen Z-A-N-T. Yeah. I warn you in advance. This is not a pretty picture, but, yeah. um, but look up this kid. Kid's yeah. six years old. Yeah. Six year old Palestinian that looks like a corpse. Yeah. That's been, I, I don't know. That's why I say, just be careful yeah. if you look it up. If you have a weak stomach, you probably don't want to, Yeah. but this is, it's not just this kid. Of course, this kid has uh MS, I think. Oh, really? So he yeah. has a higher calorie need than most people, but still like lots of, lots of people starving there. Um, diseases running rampant. They're having issues because of poor sanitation, because so much infrastructure has been destroyed. Uh, they can't get clean water and, and so forth. Um, that they're having real problem with, uh, with skin rashes and infections, um, scabies and things like that. Well, even it's even, a disaster. Even if the war ended today and they ended the blockades and everything, I mean, trying to clean that area up after what's been done is, I mean, it would be a monumental task to if you started it right now. Yeah. And the longer it goes on, it's not going to get any better. Well, um, and not I just mean, the the structures, the the damage that has been done will will result in an increased mortality for years to come. That's what I'm trying to get at is even mm -hmm. if you'd like stopped it immediately, like right now, like you're still the, we're looking at a decade here to overcome what's already mm -hmm. been done. And we're, and it's not like we're stopping or I say we're, but I, you know, it's not well, like it, it was, it's part of a, a yeah. partly on us. We, we have a, we're we, enabling this. Well, I was going to say, I mean, we have blame here. Um, so yeah, I mean it's it, but but it's not stopping. Like it's just going to continue to call this anything other than what it is is a gen it's a genocide. Like that's just what's happening here. Yeah. Um. And I, I'd like people like Netanyahu. Like that. I think that's what their goal is. Like I just I don't. I oh don't yeah, that's absolutely. Is I don't see it any other way. And for him to stand in front of Congress and make these claims. To us, I mean, he's talking, he's in Congress, but he's talking to us, the people, mm -hmm. to tell us that everything's all good and that, like, you know, we're doing everything we can to help these people that they're clearly currently trying to destroy. Yeah, well, most of it was urging Congress to continue giving him weapons. Aid, yeah. yeah. Um, um, so, yeah, uh, all that's all that's true, and it, you know, it, and it just gets worse from there also because... Um, there was, because a prisoner, a Palestinian prisoner in Israel was in such bad, like almost about to die, uh, information leaked um, that this Palestinian prisoner nearly died from being brutally, anally gang raped by IDF reservists. Um, and because of this, there was a threat. I mean, and it was reported by mainstream U.S. media. Yeah. Um, so Washington Post, New York Times, uh, CNN, etc. Yeah. Um, and so, and there were credible, well, actually, there had been uh, credible accusations of torture 
in these facilities already. And yeah. then this guy had to be transferred to hospital um, with such terrible damage that he couldn't walk. Uh -huh. Um, and, uh, so there was a threat of an international investigation. So Israel said, no, oh, no, 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 we'll take care of it. Uh -huh. Um, and there is a, like a bit of a, a, a tiff between, um, Gallant and Ben Gavir, uh, who are, it's essentially the leader of the, um, military force and the leader of the police force okay. <laughs> within Israel. Israel. Yeah. We'll talk about that more some other time because we went way longer than I thought. We're already close to an hour, and I got so much more information to yeah. cover here. Um, but anyway, uh, they the threat of an international investigation resulted in Israel saying that they would take care of it. The um, these guys that were accused were arrested by the Israeli police. These nine reservists. Um, and then a national, the response to that was nationalist protesters within Israel um, attacked is IDF military bases to try and free these reservists. Oh, wow. Meanwhile, while these bases were being attacked, the um, Israeli police kind of stood down. Yeah. We'll talk more about that some future episode, probably, as this blows up. I don't know what's going to happen between these two kind of factions two sides, within yeah. um, the Israeli government. Both of them want to kill all the Palestinians, so that's not going to help things. But there is at least yeah. like a little bit of a power struggle within. The concern, I guess, is that Israel Israel might be tearing itself apart. Yeah. Um, but who knows? Uh, so, and at the same time, um, an Israeli airstrike killed Ismail Haniye uh, in Tehran. Yeah. Like in so this guy was in Iran. Um, he's the probably the highest level Hamas um, guy outside of Gaza. Okay. Uh, but he's been involved in the negotiations for a ceasefire, and he's been pushing hard for a ceasefire. He's probably one of the more moderate. Yeah. Um, guys, and was pushing hard for a ceasefire, so they killed him. Oh, wow. <laughs> I mean, well. he, th this airstrike by Israel against this guy, this was an assassination. And yeah. it was an assassination on Iranian soil. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I tell you, man, like, there's just, there's so many angles to this and so many, like, this is just waiting for a disaster, man. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it's... That's incredible. Well, and and I think we've asserted from the beginning that the real goal here of Israel is to draw the U.S. into a war with Iran. We'll come back to that in a moment. Yeah. Um, so, so them assassinating somebody on their territory is, is a good way to lure us into that. Yeah. There was also an Israeli airstrike in Beirut, uh, Lebanon, yeah. um, that killed a Hezbollah commander. Uh, supposedly that was a response to the Hezbollah rocket that kid t killed 12 kids in a soccer field in Golan Heights. You probably heard about that one. Yeah. Um, now that's taking advantage of, uh, Americans generally not knowing anything about what's going on in these territories because yeah. the Golan Heights is an occupied territory and it's actually settled by the Jeruz people that are, uh, an Arab religious sect. So the chances that, Hezbollah intentionally targeted that are really, really slim. Yeah. Um, and Hezbollah, of course, denied that they had attacked the area, which is actually probably true. Yeah. Um, and they said that it was it was an Israeli uh, it was an Israeli defense missile that yeah. blew up on the that, soccer field. Wow. Um, that it was part of their Iron Dome system that. Yeah. Didn't landed do in the wrong was, place. Yeah. yeah. Um. Now, I don't know if that's true, but I don't think that it's likely, likely that Hezbollah, that it was a Hezbollah rocket. And if it was, it certainly wasn't intentional. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is, again, the idea that, oh, well, you know, it was a Hezbollah rocket on Israeli territory that killed a bunch of kids. Yeah, but the Israelis don't care about these kids because these kids aren't Jewish. They're Druze. Druze. Yeah. D-R-U-Z-E, not Jews. Yeah. And they're Arab people, not yeah. You know. Anyway, um, so they're just another group of occupied people that are really poorly treated by the Israelis as well, but you don't hear much about them. Yeah. And uh, at the same time that all that was going on, um, there was a U.S. airstrike in Iraq that killed four members of the Popular Mobilization Forces, which is essentially the Iraqi National Guard. Okay. 
Now, that was going on while the U.S. was negotiating with the Iraqi government to keep their military forces in Iraq. Mm. Um, the I Iraqis thought... want them out now. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> For I, sure. Of course, they've yeah. proven incapable of actually getting the U.S. to leave. So I was going to say, haven't they kicked us out before? Yes. And we said, no, we're not leaving. Yeah. I mean, that's how I remember it. But I was just making sure I wasn't like, misremembering. So... Um, Let's play one more clip from uh, from Netanyahu, and then we'll close out on a little commentary on that. All right. All right. I really ran through a bunch of information really quickly at the end because <laughs> I didn't want to keep you guys too long. Even yeah. though we're not going to have an episode next week, so maybe That's we true. should make this long just to, <laughs> just to give you a little bonus time yeah. since you'll miss us A little next extra week. content. Um, but yeah, let's play one more clip from, um, from Netanyahu. All right. For all we know, Iran is funding the anti-Israel protests that are going on right now outside this building, not that many, but they're there and throughout the city. Well, I have a message for these protesters. When the tyrants of Tehran, who hang gays from cranes and murder women for not covering their hair, are praising, promoting, and funding you, you have officially become Iran's useful idiots. Now, that bit was just sickening to me, like every aspect of it. I think the first three words of that clip are the most important. Yeah. Because he says, for all we know, yeah. so Iran ev- might be funding these protests. So for everything he says after that, like he has no, he says himself, he has no way to back that up. Yeah. I have no evidence for this assertion that I'm about to make, but I'm going to use it as the basis for everything else I say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, the end of that, where he's talking about the uh, American citizens that are um, protesting uh, for the Palestinians being useful idiots for Iran, of course, no. Iran's not funding these protests. No. Um, the, <laughs> no. I suspect some, pe- that- some people actually care about all human life. Yeah. Like there's this there's this crazy thing that that a lot of us do. Mm-hmm. And like I don't want to see anybody get hurt. Mm-hmm. Well, in the you remember for the longest time, we talked about it on this podcast that they kept saying the uh Hamas run Ministry of Defense in Ga- or Ministry of Health in Gaza yeah. every time they were citing the the death tolls. Yeah. Well, the Hamas run um Ministry of Health trying to make you believe that it was fabricated numbers. Yeah. They're not talking about that anymore. Yeah. Um, because the Ministry of Health, who, as we said before, has been historically very good, actually, about providing accurate numbers. Yeah. They only count the people that they can count. Yeah. yeah. Now, independent um, human rights organizations have estimated more like 200,000 dead in Gaza. Wow. So That's they're not just, they're not they're not disputing the accuracy of the Ministry of Health, the Hamas backed <laughs> Ministry of Health's numbers of forty thousand anymore yeah. because the other organizations are estimating far higher numbers. Yeah. And they're probably right. And they're probably right. Um and so the yeah, I the thing that bothered me the most about that is that he his assertion with no support he uses to then attack American citizens. And the response to that is all that clapping by your U S representatives and senators at the end. Yep. Yep. A That's... foreign leader comes in, attacks American citizens and Congress cheers. Yep. That's how Liberty dies. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, the, um, there, there's no the. I guess the real useful idiots are that Congress that stood up and cheered at the well, end. Well, there you go. <laughs> You're right about that. Um, I, I don't know. The, the whole deal is just it's sickening to me, and I, I it just it it astonishes me that we found ourselves here. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess if you follow it through history, I mean, there's nowhere else for us to end up with with the choices we've made as a country. Yeah. But it it's still it's just it's wild to me that we can't come up with a solution for these people. I I'm going to go back and and repeat some of the things that I said that were going on, and I I just want to point out beforehand um, that 
one of my criticisms of J.D. Vance when I was looking back at his stuff was his support of Israel, and essentially his support of Israel being that this is a Christian country and Jesus was there. Yeah. Um, and I, I know that there's a lot of Christians in this country that feel that it's some kind of responsibility to support Israel. Oh, yeah. There's, there's a lot of people that believe that. Now, if you look at your Bible— and read through it, you might realize that um, that God actually threw the Jews out of Israel. Yeah. <laughs> I think more than once. Yeah. I'm not real sharp on all my Bible reading anymore, but um, but yeah, the 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 God threw the the Jews out of Israel as a punishment. Yeah. And if <laughs> let me also point out that if uh, the Jews are God's chosen people. And it's really important to God to protect the Jews in Israel. They don't need the United States help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. What do you mean we're God? <laughs> <laughs> oh. But I, I think that if you are a Christian and you think that it's important to support the Jews, you got to you got to pay attention to what they're actually doing and think about whether God wants you to support a group of people because of the name that they claim. Yeah. Or you should maybe pay more attention to what they're doing yeah. and uh, think about whether there's morality in that or not. Because yeah. once again, they're starving the people of Gaza. Yeah, They've killed somewhere between 40,000 and 200,000 Palestinians in Gaza in less than a year. They are responsible. And remember, that there's nowhere for these people to go. Yeah, it's not like they can just pick up and leave. Yeah. Like they're they're literally stranded. Like they are attacking healthcare facilities. They're attacking uh, infrastructure facilities, uh, sanitation facilities, um, universities, schools, shelters, tent encampments with two thousand pound bombs. Um, the the result is uh, starvation, um, disease, hepatitis, and polio. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where once again the um, Israelis are not permitting the import of vaccines and yeah. lots of other medicine as well. Um, skin infections and rashes, uh, dysentery. That's what's going, that's what the Jews are doing. Now yeah. I, I say that that's kind of tongue in cheek. It's not the Jews that are doing it. It's the Israeli it's state. The Israeli if you want to support yeah. the Jews, then that's fine, but maybe you shouldn't be supporting the Israeli state. Yeah. And that's where I draw the line. The distinction is, is this is, I mean, this is government. Like, it's not our, I mean, it is our government to an extent, but this is the Israeli government doing this to these people. And and I'm a Christian, um, believe in God, the whole nine yards, but the God I worship told me to love everyone. Like, that's that's where I'm coming from here. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm you know, I don't, both sides are bad. Like, I'm not trying to say one side's better than the other, but one side is being more mistreated than the other. Like, that's where I'm at. Mm -hmm. And these uh, protesters in the U.S., um, the pro-Palestinian protesters, they recognize that. They, I mean, some of them are just out there LARPing, just like all protests. There's always going to be LARPers. But there's a lot of people that are out there protesting what's going on because they believe in human rights. They see the oppression. And that's yeah. a big part of it, is yeah. the oppression. Like, this is not the same... This is not the same as what's going on in Ukraine. This is not the same as, as most of these other conflicts where we're taking part because we're on the side of the people that are oppressing. We're on the side of the oppressors here. Yeah, yeah. 100%. I mean, that's the only way to look at it. I mean, that's just that's just what it is. Um, the, you know, the, the Israeli government can talk about the fear of being attacked by Arabs from all around, but they have no fear of the Gazans, of the yeah. Palestinians. They yeah. control the Palestinians. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about Gaza. That's a place where they control everything that comes in and out of there. Mm -hmm. Like, they have complete authority over these people. Like, I mean, these people may want to do harm to them, and I'm not going to dispute that. Yeah. Um, I mean, they have. These, these people have done harm to them, you know, recently. Like, I'm, so I'm not disputing any of that. But to think that they're a threat to the state of Israel is just insanity. Like, it's, it's yeah. just, it's not looking at the reality. And the, where that's headed is, um, 
that Iran is no threat to the United States. Yeah. Iran's no threat to the United States. Yeah. Um, but there is a huge interest that Israel has in getting the U.S. involved in a war with Iran. Yeah. Uh, and the reason and there are is, plenty of people in our government that are pushing that have long pushed for that war. Yeah, and the Israelis want to get us involved in a war with Lebanon as well. Yeah, and and there's a good reason for it. It's because without the U.S. involvement, Israel can't win those wars. Yeah, and yeah. the truth is that the U.S. wouldn't really win either. This would be a lose lose kind of thing. I mean, we may come yeah. out on top on the end with a in a war with Iran. We may defeat Iran, but the amount of resources used to achieve I mean, that are the the stuff I've heard is like we think Iraq was bad. Oh yeah, no, and Iran's Afghanistan a, a and, much bigger, more populous, and stronger country. Yeah, I mean that's like I say, I don't know, but that but what you just said is what I've heard mm-hmm. is that that this is this is more than we want to take home. Yeah. Not that we can't, but it's more than we should. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I still maintain that the reason we have the, the U S has such an interest in Iran, um, is because it is the pathway from the East to the West that doesn't travel through Russia. Oh, you yeah. essentially have to go through either Russia or Iran. Yeah. It'd be nice to have a highway through there, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> or, you know, passage. Um, so. so this is what we really need to avoid. Which and, is crazy because if we really, if that is really the the idea, is that that we want access through there, like we could get it so much easier through peace than we could through war. Yeah, that. But that I mean, is that's, one of those things is that cooperation is almost always. Actually, I would say always, but I'm sure that there's some corner cases. Yeah. Um, but uh, so we'll go with almost. Um, that cooperation is almost always more beneficial than peace. Yeah. Yeah, I or mean, it, than peace, than uh, than competition. Then, yeah, exactly. So, um, the sharing in resources, trading, is always more beneficial than fighting over resources. Yeah, because the number, the amount of resources that you lose to gain those resources is, is and then maintain them. And then, yeah, exactly. So, um, we spent six trillion dollars on the terror. Eight trillion, I think, now actually is the new number. Well, and for all the conservatives out there, because there's plenty of them that are that just are completely okay with going after Iran and and doing all of this stuff. Just remember, like we gotta spend money to do these things, mm-hmm. and just like what you were getting at with the terror wars and stuff. Like a big part of the reason we're we're at, we're at with the debt, like started after nine eleven with the terror wars. Yeah, and it's it it's just gotten no better since. Like we're never gonna get a hold to this, these problems. And you think inflation's bad now? Yeah. If Wait. you don't like your gasoline prices right now, yeah. Um, just imagine if, uh, instead of refusing to let Iran market their oil, yeah. we were trading with them for it. Yeah, exactly. And now imagine instead that we start from this point and instead of agreeing to trade with Iran for their oil, we decide to fight them instead. Yeah. Yeah, what direction you think things are going to go then? And not only will that dry that oil up off the market, but we're going to be spent make creating more debt for us, mm-hmm. which will at some point end up in inflation for us. Yeah, I mean, the more we print, the more it's going to inflate. And and we'll, if we go to war with Iran, we're printing money like the money printer go burr. Resources are limited. And any resources that are used to wage war on others are resources that can't be used to build wealth in the United States. Yeah. And we just talked about this is going to be a bigger fight than Iraq. So mm-hmm. keep that in mind. Like, yeah. I just, th- this is this is bad all the way around. Nothing good comes from it. We need to just p- pack it in, man. Like, tell Israel that they can fend for them. <laughs> Believe Sorry, me. Sorry, not our problem. Yeah, exactly. Let these... <laughs> uh, the, you created your own problems there. You deal with them. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> I mean, that's so that, that's just not going to happen. Like, there's Probably. the the hope. The best we can hope for is a de-escalation here. Yeah, I mean, but maybe uh, maybe Kamala is going the other way. I, I it would find- be interesting to me, like if if Kamala if Biden leaving the race actually created a candidate that was opposed to our support of Israel. 
Yeah. I I don't know that she's went that far. I don't think that she can because she'll get yeah. reined in by the Democrat Party. Yeah. The, the same way that Trump did. Remember, yeah. like Trump went to APAC and yeah. spoke and, and but then afterwards was kind of like, um, yeah, APAC, I don't need your money. I'm filthy rich. Like and, yeah. and the Republicans were like, No, 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 they're other candidates. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and we do need APAC money. Yeah. And and then so. it's been off to the races ever since. Yeah, yeah. Because not Trump's that he a, wasn't a supporter of of Israel before then, but he yeah. was like he didn't care about the money. Yeah, exactly. I'm not gonna cater to the lobby because I don't need it. Well, yeah. you're not yeah. the only guy though, <laughs> right? You you want to you want your guys up there, right? Yeah. This and is how it happens. I imagine Kamala would face the same kind of pressure. Oh, she will. Like she absolutely will. And she she goes where the wind blows anyway. That's true. Um, she I don't think that she's got any firm stances <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> like. Le- well, I guess it was last week. Career over principle or people. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. So, all right. So I can't speak anymore. It seems so. We'll we'll have to. It's time to wrap it up. Yeah, time to wrap it up. So wrap so nothing. Up, wrap it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Uh, um, what, what were you going to say? I was just going to say. So no podcast next week. No podcast next week. Um, we'll be back the week after that, and then we'll figure things out after that. Yeah. I'm sure we'll have plenty to talk about by then. Yeah. I have to. You imagine. Can you imagine the world a week from now? (laughs) Two weeks from now. (laughs) Two weeks from now. Can you imagine the world two weeks from now? Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to ignore it for a week. Good luck. So So let's see if it ignores you. (laughs) Well, I feel like, I feel like I can, I can pull this off. Good luck. (laughs) I got, I got a couple of books. Yeah. I'm going to. I'm going to read some fiction. I, I pulled out an old uh, um, James Joyce um, novel, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. I've never read it. Yeah. It's supposed to be one of the classics of English language literature. So, yeah. well, And I've got Stockman's old book, um, The Great Deformation. So I can yeah. I can do politics without doing current politics. I can <laughs> just read about the uh, the 2008 financial collapse. Instead. I was going to say, that's, that should be economics, right? <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, that'll be fine. And yeah. politics, but uh, but more economics. I well, I don't well, know. It's, no, it's about how the politics affected them. Oh, is it? okay. Yeah. Well, cool. Um, I it, mean, that's it's, interesting. It's about the the um, misuse of the market. Okay. Yeah, essentially. Um, all right. So uh, yeah, we'll we'll wrap it up here though, and um, we won't be here next week, but we'll be here the week after that. Yeah. And uh, in the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook. You can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean, like and share, comment, subscribe, um, leave reviews. You can always email me at michael at Um Questions, comments, information, criticism, whatever. Doesn't matter. Yeah. I read it. <laughs> You'll read them. <laughs> at the least, right? <laughs> yeah. I often respond. I try to respond. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, so join us again in a couple of weeks when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Later.